Welcome to Bard and Tart Talk About Art. Bling, 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 bling. Hello, Mr. Eric. Hello. So today Hello, we, have a, we have a special painting. Very special painting. Very special. Why did you choose it? Um, actually, I don't have any big reason for picking this exact painting, except that, you know, when I was a young man traveling on Interrail around Europe uh, with my good friend. Oh, Tomat, what are you saying, Eric? You're still a young man. Well, when I was an even younger man, uh, oh, of course. 20 years ago, um, I was traveling with a good friend. And, and after a while, like city hopping, we figured out that the modern art museums were the most interesting places to go in a lot of cities yes. um, and this is one of those paintings that I saw on one of those visits to modern art museums I cannot remember where um, but it really sort of seared itself onto my brain um, and um, so so that's that's where I know it from um, and Otto Dix was this is a painting called the scat players apparently um, and uh, I have to admit honestly that I don't know what scat is but I'm guessing it's the game they're playing um, but it's it's painted by a German artist called Otto Dix in 1920 apparently or around there um, and Otto Dix belonged to or was sort of lumped in with this artistic movement called the Neue Sachlichkeit uh, which has been translated into new objectivity which is not really um, that precise it's more like new matter of factness and oh, interesting yeah I didn't know that yeah and like along with people like George Grosch if you know him yeah yeah um, yeah yeah and they were sort of reacting against uh, expressionism um, and abstract art as well um, what they wanted was they wanted art to interact with with the world and to comment on the world and to, to have a viewpoint on the world again um, they wanted mm -hmm. art to be part of the you know the public discourse um, and not this sort of introverted focus on the individual's anxiety that they felt expressionism was and and i think that's a that's a pretty fair assessment in a lot of ways um and and the abstract art of course was art for art's sake um um, and this is sort of art to communicate a message clearly. So, um, you know, so World War I obviously was this huge trauma in European history. It was um, the most brutal war the world had known at that point. It was, I mean, I think all, all war is meaningless, but there was something just so, so incredibly meaningless about, you know, these endless weeks and months spent along the same front lines, your feet rotting in the mud of the trenches. Um, it was just uh, horrific, like almost absurdly terrible, right? Um, or I think not almost, it was a completely absurd experience. And uh, these, uh, a number of these painters came back from the front lines of World War I and, and started to make Paintings like this, among others. Um, so obviously, this is—I don't know if that's obvious, but my interpretation is the is that these are three war veterans um, having a grand old time playing cards. Um, and I think for me, as a young man, and still, I, like the, the the grotesque quality of it was very appealing to me. Um, but I also like how. For me, this has a, a kind of a unique quality in that it has this combination of a painted appearance and at the same time, it looks very collage-y um, in the way that he put it together. And I love the way that it's sort of at the same time completely flat and then a bit spatial also. Um, so it's for me, it's sort of full of intriguing details. And at the same time, it has this sort of in-your-face gruesome quality to it that um, I think leaves an impression on you for sure for sure uh and and you were you were saying that uh, for you it's uh, veterans why um because of their injuries you know they they're missing legs um they've got you know wounds in the face um they've you know one is missing a nose i mean these are people that in my estimation one has a what what seems like a wooden or a metallic hand 
and one has a metallic jaw. These are people uh, that have been certainly wounded, crippled somehow, um, that are, you know. And one has a medal, a medal that seems like a medal of honor. Or exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Condecoration from, yeah. from war or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. And uh, have, have you noticed that in the lamp, there is a little, uh, a little oh, skull? Yeah. skull? Now that you say it, I do notice that. I think that's that's a clever detail. It is one of, I mean, there's one thing you can't say for this painting, and that is that it's subtle. I think it's very in your face with what it's trying to say, right? Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I really appreciate how effectively um, it gets across the horror that Otto Dix is trying to communicate. And I think like putting that little skull subtly in there, that's one of the ways in which, that's one of the more subtle ways in which he's making this a very uncomfortable painting to look at, even when you don't know exactly why you're com uncomfortable, as in the case of that that lamp, which I hadn't noticed. Yeah, and it, it's interesting that you mentioned that it's kind of um, an answer to, abs not to abstractionism, because, but to uh, expressionism, right? Yeah, expressionism and abstract art, like both. And abstract, yeah, abstract yeah. art already, yeah. Because uh, I don't know exactly when uh, Cubism arrived, but I, I know that, for example, Picasso and also the Dead mm. East and all of that, mm -hmm. they, for example, the, the newspaper that you say that it feels, you know, kind of collage, mm -hmm. Picasso and the, uh, the Cubists and the Dadaists, they would pay, put that that newspaper there, you know, it seems yeah. like it's almost yeah. as if it were, it had been, you know, a real paper. Yeah. A lot of the times the Cubists would do that. And also the chairs, you know, the texture mm -hmm. of their chairs. Right. The Cubists would probably also put like the real texture of a chair, like a little piece of the fabric, you know? Exactly, exactly. So, also, in, like... in a way, it's kind of uh, um, emulating the, you know, that style of the of the, the cubists and and also you know the way this is abstract it's it's very it resembles a lot cubism the way he breaks perspective and the way he breaks the shapes absolutely the... absolutely yeah i agree with that it's interesting yeah. because um when i sort of was reading up on this stuff um i didn't hear a lot of people say um that these guys were interested uh, or inspired by cubism, but I think they must have been. Um, I think one of the things that was sort of um, uh, characteristic of, of the Neue Sachlichkeit was that these people didn't travel very widely. And so even sort of within the Neue Sachlichkeit, there are like two or three very different directions that they go in and they didn't inspire each other very much actually. It's more. It was more a general sort of zeitgeist that was then lobbed into this category. It wasn't one of those artistic scenes where, where you know, the artists were sort of uh, sitting down in the in the salons and and agreeing on manifestos. It was more, yeah. you know, art art historians, art uh, theorists, sort of lumping them together like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there is a lot of um, cubism to this. And the interesting thing about that as well, I think, is that with cubism, cubism is sort of concerned with, for me at least, um, what I know of it, it's sort of concerned with, you know, exploring new ways of depicting things, you know, it's essentially sort of playing around with the tools of the artists in new ways and, and questioning our established ideas of, of perspective and, and of the world, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I think- It's he... about form, not so much about content. This exactly. is about content. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that was my, the point I was getting at. If you would let me, Simao, was I'm that... so sorry, Eric. <laughs> my point for, oh, sorry, my, my fault for making an obvious point, I guess. But yeah, he's, he's taking those tools and he's using them for something very different. And I think, um, and I think it, it's sort of, like the flatness of the image just sort of contributes to the quality of sort of sensory overload um, that mm -hmm. sort of is part of making it very in your face, uh, very sort yeah. of very aggressive because it's all right there, smashed right up into your face, right? There's no sort of 
There's no dead space anywhere on the picture that your eye can sort of rest. Um, yeah. E even the even the chair legs, um, these sort of weird chair legs that sort of crisscross with the wooden the peg legs of the the veterans. They have this sort of weird, uncomfortable, you know, messy quality to them, like tangled quality to them. That it's just everything about this painting is just not pleasant. And at the same time, I think it's a it's a, an exquisitely crafted painting. Like it's very well done. So. Um, yeah, it's grotesque, but in an aesthetic way. Exactly, exactly. The way he plays with the 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 fiber of the cloth, and and you know, there's a lot of stuff like that that is sort of really satisfying and sort of textured uh, in a nice way. Yeah, it's it reminds me of uh, it of uh, you know covers of heavy metal bands. <laughs> well, you know, I, I I I grew up being into heavy metal, and I think some of the grotesqueness of this sort of definitely sort of uh you know appeals to me on that level it, it appeals to that you know my, uh -huh. my inner teen you know just loving how how extreme it is you know but i think it's at yeah. the same time i think it's not for me this is not you know um sensationalistic or i mean i don't think there's a that that's just a danish word i'm sort of pretending is english um I think it's not gross in the way it sort of tries to make you feel something. It's not tacky in the way that a lot of heavy metal album covers would be, you know, just like boobs and blood and, and you know, monsters. Um, I think this is, you know, I think this, the, the subject matter of this painting warrants the treatment he's giving it. Um, um, and so I think, you know, I think the like that was that was a thing that you know high society in Berlin in the 1920s needed to be acutely aware of is just how many people in their myths mostly at the bottom of society were suffering from the consequences of this terrible war you know um I think that was that was a point that you know that was well worth making and well worth making in the most sort of emphatic way possible. Yeah, and, and I think for me that's that's what differs the most from the other movements that you referred, like expressionism or cubism and all of that. Mm. Because those, as you were saying, it's more more form and not so much content. Mm -hmm. And so you were you were saying that this is what kind of the bourgeoisie didn't want to see, what the society didn't want to see. And for me, that's the difference be, be, because when you're just treating form, when you just look at um, I don't know a vase of flowers and then you deconstruct it or a guitar or whatever, mm -hmm. you know everyone can hang that on the wall. Yeah. But to have this kind of painting hanging on your mm -hmm. wall, yeah. you know, it's tough. Yeah. You don't want to look at this every day, otherwise, you know, you start going crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, it's a very anti, uh, you know, anti bourgeois, anti 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 establishment. Mm -hmm. This painting, in that sense, because it doesn't seem very commercial, you know, very well done, but yeah. doesn't seem very commercial. I don't know. Maybe it was. Maybe it was sold back in the day for a very good price i don't know no i think what? that in general the the it seems to me like the painters in the neue sachlichkeit sort of um they were sort of coming into you know uh they were coming into to prominence like right at the end of the 20s early 30s and then of course uh the nazi movement happened and all of it was labeled entarte to art uh, you know, like degenerated art, and and they were yeah. m uh, most of them left the country. You know, um, mm -hmm. and and I guess um, it's sort of the the Neue Sachlichkeit. I think if you look at painters like Otto Dix and George Gross, um, a few of the others as well, I think they are um, sort of world class art history figures. Um, but I think because a lot of them, they went, they dispersed and they went a lot of different places and they ended up doing a lot of different things. And so the movement just sort of didn't really have time uh, to settle in people's minds and imaginations and, and, and to influence uh, what came after. 
in the way that something like cubism or expressionism did. Um, because I think these guys were doing, if you look at Josh Gross as well, there's a third one that is really great as well. And I'm not saying the name because I'm worried I will embarrass myself. I think he was called Max Beckmann. Um, he, okay. Who was also oh, yeah. who was also really excellent. Um, That's true. And uh, and and I mean I think these guys were doing something very interesting, and it wasn't picked up picked up that much later on. Um, and so for me, it stands as this sort of really interesting pocket in art history, um, sort of isolated pocket where there's just a lot of uh, like really interesting striking stuff to find if you go yeah. look. And my guess, my guess would be because, you know, even later on, the reason why they were not picked up, it's because still, you know, for the the bourgeoisie of the, the post-war bourgeoisie, you know, the mm -hmm. post-World War II bourgeoisie, the ones that made, you know, Picasso really famous and, you know, Pollock and so on, and even the ones that came from, you know, the post, the, the, the modern and the post-modern yeah. as well, yeah, in a way. Mm -hmm. But, you know... For those early buyers, this to have this stuff on the wall, you know, would still, I guess that it would still be uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Compared to those guys, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. probably that's why, because, you know, fame follows money a little bit. So, mm. you know, if you want to be famous, you need to sell a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, like, this is, this is. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, this is engaging with with the current moment that the artist is in, in a way that, you know, there's, I think in art, in the history of art, there has often been this focus on creating something timeless, something sublime for the ages, right? Something that expresses some eternal idea, you know? Um, and this is very much commenting on something that's super topical right at this point in history, right? And it just so happens that, you know, 1920s Berlin is one of those sort of flashpoint places and places in time that, you know, still to this day, there's a lot of art, you know, a lot of movies, TV series, books, comics being made about that period of time. So we know what this is. Um, but I think in general, that has been sometimes a tougher sell for artists if they're commenting. It's, it's the kind of thing that tends to belong more in, you know, satirical art in newspapers and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it has more. I think also that uh, that, that it has a, an illustrative yes, touch. I think so right? too. Yeah, this could definitely go with an article on you know uh, on on war veterans in Berlin. You know, um, yeah, to be sure. But actually, I disagree on the fact that it's not timeless because we are we still have war veterans. There are still wars going on. There are still people that come without a leg, without an eye, you know? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he is situating in very specifically in that time, right? Like that that, that medal is, you know, a medal that a German veteran would have at that point in time, etc. So, I mean, I think his intention was to make it very current. Um, yeah. But, but of course, the, the theme is, unfortunately, you know, you know mm -hmm. timeless, to be sure. But then... Then, I, then I, I think, for example, about Guernica. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's it's the it's it's kind of the same thing. You know, a war, people mm -hmm. being destroyed by war, right? The way war destroys you. Yeah. But for some reason, I think I and that you know, Guernica will always. I think it will always be you know, in temporal. You know, it mm -hmm. will always be regarded as you know a timeless, yeah, timeless uh, masterpiece and. Maybe this one not as well, and is that because it, that's uh, a, something that is inherent to the picture itself, or is it something that has to do with the marketing over the picture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think Ganica, also... Ganica, Ganica is a more ab abstract approach to what he's trying to portray, right? It's a more metaphorical. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that. I would say that it's more metaphorical. But the title of the painting, Guernica, it's extremely specific. Certainly, certainly. But you could retitle it, you know, Aleppo or something, and it would work uh, just as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> so. that's another thing I think that I, I think about. I, I mean, now we we diverge we divert a little to to Guernica, but I. I 
as as we talked before, you know, he's a very decorative painter. Yeah. So he's, he's and he's and we were talking uh, and we were talking about cubism and form. And of course, he was he, he was one of the um, the pioneers of cubism. And he was always always worried about form. He really I don't think he really honestly deeply cared about war. He just thought. Mm, this is a theme for a great painting, you know. <laughs> I don't think he was worried about the war. He was more worried about creating a great painting. And I think this one, this painting that we're looking uh, right now is more about, you know, the war than yeah. about creating a great painting, you know. Even though it's a great painting, but yeah, it yeah. definitely has an agenda. Yes. And Guernica also had an agenda, but I feel it's more... The agenda, you know, it's more superficial. Mm. It's more, you know, a, a bourgeois version of of problems, you know, like, yeah. I don't know, like people now post on Instagram stuff, you know, I don't know, Free Tibet or Free is almost the same, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think Pica the, that Guernica has a bit of that, for me personally, has a bit of that vibe of, you know, making a big metaphor out of something that was actually very real yeah yeah um, I did there is I mean I think I, I'm, I'm glad you say that because I've always been I I've always enjoyed Ganica on on you know just as a beautiful painting to be sure you know it, it's a it's a masterpiece I don't think there's any real reasonable doubt there um but but whenever you know some art historian has prefaces saying that this is sort of this gruesome you know deeply affecting visceral experience and for me it's never really been that because for me it's always been a little too couched in like like you say poetics and like metaphor and beauty and stuff like that to really sort of portray the raw horror of what he was trying to portray so um, um, but I mean, I, I mean, and and then does that make it less good than this? I don't think so. They're doing different things. Um, but, yeah, exactly. But I, but I exactly. do appreciate, you know, and 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 art that's created to con to communicate something can be, um, it can become boring. You know, uh, it can mm -hmm. become too one on one. But I do appreciate when somebody is really able to. Like just really hammer the point across in the way that Otto Dix does here. I think very effectively. I think he makes a good good case for that it can be done and it can be done well, even though a lot of people do it terribly. You know, the whole yeah. sort of art and in the and in the beginning you mentioned that this was kind of a reaction to you know the the the. Um, the inner anxiety that yeah. the painters were showing with particularly in expressionism mm -hmm. and so this was a reaction to it but i mean there is so much anxiety in this painting <laughs> right <laughs> to be sure to be sure to be sure it is very like that's the, that's that's the interesting thing right it is um it is expressionistic in the sense that it is it's expressing something very clearly you know it is it is distorting reality reality for the purpose of you know an extreme form of expression um so so and and but that was part of what was interesting i think about the neue sachlichkeit is that they were using these sort of like like cubism and 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 some of the extremes of expressionism but they were using using them uh to a to a different end right um like people like dix and grosch and, and i think beckman was his name um mm -hmm. uh, yeah and I, and I think uh so so what they were against was not so much the fact that expressionism was sort of extreme and grotesque which it can be right um but what they were against was that it was sort of about the artist's inner anxieties you know uh they were sort of navel gazing um, yeah to these people's minds um and i think yeah i think that's that's yeah. a fair point you know it's <laughs> I, I... I think it's more of a bourgeois kind of anxiety, right? Right, right, exactly. It's like problems in a more abstract way, you know, my inner, you know, problems, my inner world. And this is, you know, the problems of the world, you know, it's a general anxiety, it's a societal mm -hmm. anxiety. 
Certainly. And one of the things I actually kind of like about the painting as well is that, and, and we haven't talked about this at all, this at all, but at the same time as, as this is horrific to look at, uh, to be sure, and the, like these people are maimed in these sort of terrible ways, at the same time, those three guys seem to be enjoying themselves pretty well, you know, that's true. they seem to be having a good time. And I think that's, I think that's one of the, the, the qualities I appreciate a lot in this painting as well, is that he's showing us that these people are sort of in a terrible state. Um, and he's making us, you know, worry about them and people like them, but he's not turning them into like, you know, they're not like, you know, those sort of terrible goodwill ads with, um, you know, starving African children with fly flies on them, etc. You know, um, he's not making them pitiful in that way. So he's sort of, he, he's straddling that line. And there's also, it sort of adds, that's one thing um, that he might have been trying to do. The other thing is also that it adds to the grotesque quality of it, you know. That they're mm -hmm. sort of yeah, it's they're a looking they're looking kind of merry, but at the same time, you know, they're obviously in in terrible shape in some ways, right? Yeah, it's it's an emotional paradox. Therefore, yeah. it seems even more exactly grotesque. Exactly, exactly. If they had been looking but, sad, it would have been it would have been too one to one in some ways. I think. Yeah, and it's interesting that that you mentioned that they seem kind of merry because. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, you know, even though we don't have much of um, uh, indication of where this scene is happening, you know, the, the, the background is pretty flat. Mm -hmm. The indications that we have is that is the chairs and mm -hmm. the table. Mm -hmm. And then there's the newspapers mm -hmm. uh, on the on the wall or on some yeah. kind of stands. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever seen uh, newspapers like that. Have you ever? I feel like I've seen them in libraries, I feel like. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. exactly. Yeah. So I'm not so that my guess would be that probably those newspapers would be in a cafe. My guess mm. is that these people mm -hmm. are in a cafe. Yeah. What do you think? That's also that's always that, that that's the feeling I've always had to be sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so that makes me think of the absent drinkers. Do you mm. know the paintings of the 19th century paintings of, you know, the the absent drinkers? I think that Lautrec would do. And I think maybe mm -hmm. also Picasso made absent drinkers. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I've know seen, the kind of, the kind of paintings of that those. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. talking about? Yeah. That's usually, it's usually like one person, sometimes a woman, mm. drinking uh, their absent and being absolutely miserable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right and i think i think that's a good comparison of what we were talking about mm. because you know those people it's an uh, one person mm. sad mm -hmm. because of their inner world right they have you know they have an addiction that they're dealing with mm -hmm. you know it's something that it's an individual right battle yes and this is you know a societal issue this you know yeah it's people that are like this because of war and yet these people are merry mm -hmm. and that's people you know just drinking alone mm -hmm. absent with their both legs with both of their eyes you know <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 they're miserable so it's an interesting interesting um paradox yeah i think i, I think it's it's I think he's he's respectful of these characters when he's making them. And I mean that that's it's in a way it's also weird to talk about them like that because they are clearly symbols at the same time, right? But but they're yeah. they're right on that edge between being sort of symbols and stand-ins for things and then being actual characters because they have life, you know, and there's I think there's a lovely lively quality to the the you know the way they they move, they're posed. Um, you know, like the yeah. figure on the right, the way one arm is like underneath his head and one arm is above and, 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 and especially the figure on the left with the, you know, the foot that's going all the way up to the, in this yeah. completely impossible pose. There's just a lot of life, um, to these yeah, characters. That is playing cards with his foot. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, um, there's a, there's definitely a morbid sense of humor to this painting as well, which, yeah. Definitely. Which clearly is part of what I reacted to as well, to be sure. 
Do you know what they remind me also of? They remind me of the um, the toys from Toy Story One. Mm. You know the ones yeah. from the kids that likes to destroy toys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because those toys, they also look grotesque. They're also made of different bits. They also miss eyes and all of that. They look like monsters. As these people, they kind of look a bit like monster monsters yeah, yeah. in this painting. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, those toys, they're kind of happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't recall that they're happy, but they're victims. You know, they they look like monsters, but they're victims. I think. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, yeah, kind of yeah. like these guys. But yeah. in uh, as far as I remember from the movie, which I also don't remember much is that you know they kind of you know they adapted they were not depressed you know They're, they formed their own society to be sure exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it and i think yeah it, it is a it is an apt comparison also in that i think otto Dix would definitely say that these people have been the toys of reckless powerless people and now they are ruined um, yeah and that's that's what he wants us to see with this painting um, and like I've said a number of times yeah, now, I think that's he... a beautiful metaphor right there. <laughs> yeah, and I think he gets it across very powerfully. So, very yeah, cool painting for me. Yeah. All right, mm-hmm. I think that's it. I think that's it as well. So, at some point in the conversation, uh, there are some <clears throat> technical mistakes, uh, technical issues. And the first time there is a technical issue, uh, there is a gap. And so um, it's it's a bit hard to understand that I was talking about Picasso. I was saying that Picasso is very concerned about uh, form. He's a more decorative uh, painter than, uh, in this case, specifically uh, Otto Dix and uh, this painting Scat. And the second time that there was uh, that there was a mistake is uh, I mentioned Free Tibet, and then I was comparing it to, for example, Free Beat, the Free Britney movement. You know, the people that put you know hashtags just free this, free that, and you know, whatever people put hashtags about. Not in the sense that people don't care about those causes, but in the sense that a lot of the time those causes, the way people defend those co- causes, can be in a quite superficial way. And so I was comparing that kind of, you know, superficial approach to to pain and to real um, problems to the way, you know, that Picasso approached Gr- Guernica in contrast with the way that Otto Dix approached Gr- approach, approached um, the veterans of the of, uh, of the war uh, in a more, I would say. Um, honest, uh, deep way.